Hi, all my lover friends. Thank you for attending today's Venerable Children's online talk on living a happy life, COVID or not. These talks are hosted by Young Buddhist Association of Malaysia, Penang State License Committee, and co hosted by Buddhist Gem Fellowship, Butterworth Lay Buddhist Society, and Friends of Sorasti Abbey, Singapore. The Buddha taught that the mind is the source of our happiness and suffering. Today, Venerable Children, she will offer some tips on how we can have a happy mind regardless of our external circumstances, such that we can practice kindness, compassion, and stay balanced during and after this time of pandemic. Now, let me give you some introduction about today's speaker, Venerable Children. She is an American Buddhist nun, the founder and the abbess of Sovereignty Abbey, a Buddhist monastery in Newport, Washington, United States. Ordained since 1977, she is a student of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Zenzat Sarkong Rinpoche, and several other Tibetan Lamas. She has authored many books on Buddhist philosophy and meditation, and is currently assisting His Holiness the Dalai Lama with the writing and publication of the Library of Wisdom and Compassion, a 10-plus volume series on the entire Buddhist path. Please visit tibetanchildren.org org for a media library of venerable teachings and also sovrastiavi.org to learn more about the avis so all my dharma friends please put our palms together to welcome venerable and now let us do three prostration to venerable children with you today it's mother's day in your part of the world so uh, everybody please appreciate your mothers um, my mother died in 2008. So, uh, you know, while your mom and dad are alive, please appreciate them and, uh, and have good, good connection with them. Yeah, because they won't always be there and, and you may not always be there either. Okay, so we're going to, um, to talk tonight about how to be happy COVID or not, okay? So um, before starting the talk, I always like to, uh, to sit and, you know, let everybody catch their breath. Yeah, and, uh, you know, have your screen up, sit still, and, uh, you know, so that we can focus on the talk. Okay, and then lower your eyes and, and let's watch your breath for a minute. And then we'll cultivate our motivation and begin the talk. <clears throat> so in generating our motivation, let's remember that all sentient beings at one time or another in our previous lives have been our parents. And most people, not everybody, but most people feel quite close to their mother or whoever it was, grandmother who brought them up. And so to remember the kindness of our parents and then remember that everybody has been that kind to us when they have been our parents in previous lives. And when we think of others' kindness towards us and understand that we've really been the recipient of tremendous amount of kindness in our lives, then that really changes our attitude towards other living beings. And we appreciate them and we want to return that kindness to them. We want to be kind in, in return to other living beings. And the best way to show our kindness 
is by leading others on the path to awakening. And so we generate the long-term motivation to attain Buddhahood ourselves so we can be competent to lead others on the path. So that's the bodhicitta motivation. And we generate that now. And may it be our motivation for sharing the Dharma tonight so we can learn about how to progress on the path to awakening. Then slowly open your eyes, come out of your meditation. Okay. So, how to be happy, COVID or not. I thought I would um, share some things with you uh, about what I read that some people were experiencing because of COVID and how they uh, changed the situation around so that something that was uh, upsetting to them, you know, being locked in the house, being in the middle of a pandemic and so on, uh, how it became something that really motivated them to use their life in a better way and to set their priorities very clearly in life. Okay. Uh, could I ask people please to hold their computer uh, still? Somebody is turning their computer around and around. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, just please put the computer down. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, when people's lives are disrupted by crisis, that often shocks them and uh, it makes them, makes them, makes us rethink uh, what is really important in our life and what are we doing with our time? Yeah, where are we putting our energy? Um, it makes us re-examine our relationships with other people and see if we are having the kind of relationships we want to have, yeah. So the pandemic has kind of thrown everybody into that situation. And it can be something that is really good. Often, you know, when things change like that, when it's an unwanted change, we freak out. And, uh, you know, our whole world looks like it's topsy-turvy. But if we just... You know, so much depends on how we respond to all of that change. So we can let ourselves go in the old habit of just going, ah, or we can, um, you know, really take the time to stop and pause and look at our lives and look at our Dharma practice. Hold on one second. Who was here? All the crunchy? Oh, no, my tree went and stepped on the paper bag, so I put it away. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> there was noise in the background here. I thought somebody came in the room and it was the cat who was stepping on some paper, making a lot of noise. <laughs> You'll probably, she'll come by probably later and introduce herself. You usually see her tail come across the screen first. So uh, when it does, that's my tree. Okay, she's my roommate. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. So, um, you know, in confront of all this change that is making us reassess our life, okay? So some people have come up with some really creative things. There was one man in the US who uh, lived in a big apartment block and, uh, you know, they, it, they were on lockdown. They weren't, you know, supposed to go out of the house except to the grocery store, but that was, you know, you were putting yourself in danger if you did that. And uh, so what he did is he arranged for some vegetable delivery uh, to come to the flats, the uh, apartment complex where he lived. And in doing that, he had to talk to his neighbors. He met all of his neighbors. Yeah, do you know all of your neighbors? You sit, you're in big flats. Do you know the people on top of you, below you, to the sides of you? Sometimes we don't even know the people, yeah? Or you see them in the elevator or on the stairs, but you've never talked to them. So for this man, this was the real opportunity to, to talk to his neighbors and get to know his neighbors. And he said that, um, you know, by helping to provide this, this service of vegetable delivery for everybody, he felt really connected to all these people that he didn't really know from before. So that was something really valuable to him because people, we often um, feel a lot of meaning in our lives by our connection with other living beings. Yeah. We don't uh, live as isolated people unrelated to others as we know from the Buddha's teachings, you know, we're so interdependent with others and they've been kind to us. And so for this man, it was a chance to connect to the community around where he lived and it made his life feel very purposeful, okay? So for other people, um, Maybe it just gives them the time to look at their lives and to see uh, how they've been living. Yeah. Now, many people, when they stop and pause and look at their lives, what they think about is what they don't like about their lives, what isn't going well. This is going, I don't like this, and on and on, complains and and then you talk yourself into feeling so lousy. And then I'm so mad at this pandemic because I can't go out. When I do go out, I can't go to the places where I want to go. And, you know, all this complaining and, and aggravation. And that's how our mind often goes, COVID or not, is into, <laughs> into complaining and being unhappy with situations. Yeah. But... It doesn't take much to do. We shift it. And instead of seeing what's going wrong with our life, we start to look at and ask ourselves, what's going right with my life? Yeah. And what's happening in my life that is really good, that I really appreciate. Because so often we take the good things in our life so much for granted uh, that we don't even notice them until they're not there and then we complain. But, uh, you know, if we can really take this time and see what is going well and appreciate in our life. You know? And for example, just the fact that today we had food to eat. Yeah, did we really appreciate that today? You know, do, do we appreciate that we're sitting in a place that is uh, safe right now. Yeah. You know, there's many people without food, many people not living in a safe place. So if we can stop and appreciate what we do have, you know, we do have friends, we do have kind people in our life. There are people who care about us. You know, sometimes we talk ourselves into feeling very lonely and unloved and alienated and nobody understands me. 
But actually, there's a lot of people in our lives that do care about us. And we often don't notice that. Or we take it so much for granted that we accuse them of not caring about us because there's so much a part of our lives that we stop appreciating them. Yeah. So, you know, just pausing and being able to look and say, wow, um, you know, these people that I see every day, either in your family, in your workplace, uh, you know, in the stores where you go, and, and just appreciate that, that those people are in your lives and they care. Okay, instead of always looking at, uh, you know, what we don't like. A lot of times when in a situation like this, uh, when we step back and we evaluate our lives, you know, not only do we see, uh, we start to appreciate the people in them and the, and the good conditions we have in our life, but we um, often start to see where the openings for change are. Yeah, because sometimes we just get so much in the habit of in our lives uh, that sometimes it feels like, gee, I'd like, you know, to do something creative. I'd like to do something new. And uh, and when you have to stop, then you have the time to ask yourself, well, what would I like to do that I'm not doing now? And then many people decide to, uh, yeah, to try all sorts of new things. You, know, you might say, well, I can't go out, you know, but you, you can learn a lot of things sitting in your own flat, you know. I mean, we have the internet, which is amazing. So, you know, people, they, can, they decide that they want to exercise so, you know, you, you get an exercise app or you want to learn painting or you want to learn music or you want to learn about different kind of plants and trees and things like that. Uh, or you want to learn about geography or about life in other countries or about different, you know, people in different uh, ethnic groups. Or There's so many things to learn about in the world, including the Dharma. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now you can open your life to to learn some of these things and put your energy in that direction. OK, so instead of feeling bored or instead of feeling, oh, my life, I just do the same thing all the time, uh, you know, use the time of the pandemic to kind of change the situation and really learn to new, do some new things and uh, develop talents that, you know, you've wanted to, to try out uh, for a long time, but you never have. Okay, so that can, um, yeah, that can be really a, a way to invigorate our life. So for some people, you know, facing COVID, you know, people who are very disorganized in their life, then what they may decide to do uh, is organize their life and, you know, give themselves a schedule and get themselves organized. Other people who tend to be very organized and a bit stiff and fanatic about how organized they are, then they can take the time to just relax a bit and, and learn to be flexible and try some new things. Okay, so, you know, see what, what you are curious about and, and explore it and learn more, okay? And it, you don't need to wait to be in the middle of a pandemic to do this, okay? I think it's really important in our lives that all the time we check up so that is that we really feel that we're putting our energy in a good direction. You know, especially as Dharma practitioners, we know that our life isn't going to last forever. 
we know that that death is something that's definite and we don't know when it's going to happen. And we also know that at the time of death, what we take with us is the karma we've created, all of our mental habits and so on. And so this is the time now to really uh, create the virtuous karma that we want to take with us, to purify the non-virtuous karma that we want to be free from, okay? To establish some really good mental habits uh, so that we can take those with us in, in our next life, okay? So again, even, you know, before I was talking about taking people for granted, we also take the Dharma for granted. We take the fact that we um, have encountered the Dharma, that we have access to teachers and teachings. We just take that for granted and it's like, okay, well, yeah, that's nice, but uh, tonight I'd rather do this or that or the other thing. I don't really want to go to for a Dharma talk. But when we, um, you know, think about it and what's really valuable in our life, the Dharma should be something that is close to the top, if not the, the most valuable thing. Okay. So really to, to live our lives from that perspective. Um, it's, it's also important, I think, to, uh, to care for other people, to repay the kindness uh, that others show us. And one way to repay kindness with some people is to let them take care of us. Okay, there's a lot of people that want to offer help, like if we're sick or, or whatever, but sometimes we are so proud. We go, no, 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 I don't need any help. Uh, it's, I'm all okay. Uh, yeah, it's fine. And we don't let people into our lives in the sense of letting them, to, you know, care for us when we need uh, the care. So I think that's important. It's, uh, I've had many discussions with people about generosity. And we usually think of generosity, uh, the perfection of generosity, of us giving something to others. But also, I think part of perfecting generosity is to allow other people to give to us, okay? Allow other people to create merit by helping us or giving us things, okay? And some people feel very, um, like, they don't want to do that. They feel, oh, if I, if I let somebody help me, then I'm going to be obliged to help them back. And I don't want to feel obliged to anybody. Or if I let them help me, then they're going to call me later. And they're going to want me to do something really hard for them. And I don't want to do that. Okay. So what we do is we, we put these blocks up in our life. Yeah. So no, no, you don't, I don't need anything. Don't give it, don't give me anything. Don't do anything for me. And we're not giving people the opportunity to create merit. Yeah. And they need that opportunity. So we need to get over our pride and our fear of obligation and so forth. Are you getting what, what I'm saying about this? Yeah, I had a situation once where um, somebody was offering me something and I, you know, I was going, no, 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 it's, it's okay, it's, you know, no, no, no. And my teacher was in the room, one of my teachers was in the room, and he said to me, no, you should accept what this person's giving you, yeah. He, he wants to give. It makes him happy to give. You create merit by giving him the chance to create merit. Yeah. And it really kind of shocked me because I had always thought of giving as, you know, what I'm doing. And, and to give somebody else the opportunity to, to care, to give something to me. 
was was very important. And after that, I began to notice that how much people uh, take joy in giving. And if I am not a good recipient, then I've deprived them of that joy of giving. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, uh, there's many aspects to giving, you know, to really think about here. And what does generosity really mean? Um, yeah. So one of that is, you know, let people give us material things, uh, but also let them help us. Yeah. Why, why do we want to pretend, you know, it, it's really arrogance, isn't it? Yeah, I, you know, oh, I don't need any help. I can manage my whole life. Okay. You know, <laughs> like, like, you know, we can control the world and control our life and everything in it. And that's a big joke. Yeah, we can't control everything. Okay. Um, and then also, you know, to spend the time that COVID gives us to think about what really is important in our life and what's the meaning of our life. And I think that's like the most important um, question to ask ourselves. What's the meaning of my life? Yeah, Because at the time of death, you know, we're going to say, okay, I, I live this life, but what was the ultimate purpose of it all? Yeah, what am I leaving with? What did I do? And that's where some people who have never thought about what's the meaning of my life, uh, then at that time, as they're nearing death, then they get quite scared. And they also have a lot of regret because they look back on their life and they say, oh, there were these opportunities to do things, to help others or connect with others or, you know, offer some, you know, some quality to society. And I didn't take it. Yeah. Or instead, what I did was I was nasty to other people or I exploited other people or I talked bad about them behind their back and I never apologized, you know, because I was too proud to apologize. So these kinds of um, regrets can easily come up at death. So that's why it's important, you know, I think always to, to have this question and contemplate it about, you know, what really is the meaning and, and purpose of our lives. And, uh, and if we do that, if we think about that, then we make very wise choices. And when we slow down and make wise choices, then we live an ethical life. And then we don't have, we don't have so many regrets when we die. Because if you talk to people who have regrets in their life, yeah, and, you know, what did they regret? It's usually when they harmed other people. Yeah. And then they never apologized. They never fixed the relationship up. They never, you know, if they took money that was... Uh, Somebody loaned them money, but instead of repaying it, they kept it and they never, re, you know, repaid it to the other person. These kinds of things come up at the time of death. And we don't want that. You know, we don't want to die with regrets. So it's always a good time to, to really check and see in our lives, are there things that we regret um, having done? And if so... Yeah. Uh, are we in a situation where we can make amends to the people who were involved? Yeah. So maybe we need to go to the other person and apologize to them. Um, maybe the other person, we've lost touch with them. 
Maybe they've died. We can't go and apologize. But what we can do is in our own mind, you know, imagine them and imagine apologizing. We can do purification practice, thinking, you know, whatever negative karma I created from that action, you know, I regret it and I want to purify that. And so really, you know, engaging in purification practice. So we see that, that there's so much to, to do in our lives uh, karmically, yeah, in terms of creating virtue, abandoning non-virtue, purifying non-virtue. Yeah. So if you think about this, then you're never going to get bored in your life. Uh, yeah, I think if you if you really practice the Dharma, you are never bored because there's always something to do to make your life meaningful. Yeah. And and so you never sit there like, uh, duh, like, uh, uh, I want something to entertain me. Um, you know, well, go do some prostrations. Go imagine the Buddha. Uh, you know, go watch a Dharma teaching. <laughs> yeah, what are you bored about? You know, sometimes we're bored because we really want to be entertained. Okay, it's like, oh, I feel so lazy. I want somebody to entertain me. So then we turn on the television and we watch some kind of junk on the TV. Okay, but instead of doing that, you know, in, read the Dharma. Yeah, read a Dharma book. I'm sure that there's lots of things that you've wanted to read that that you haven't had a chance to. And if and if you're looking for something to read, I can recommend some books to you. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So uh be careful. In fact, I might even quiz you on some of the books and see if you're reading them or not. <laughs> okay. Um, another thing that often happens when uh, our routines are disrupted, like in the pandemic, is that we, uh, we learn to be more honest with ourselves. We learn to be more honest with other people. We um, get rid of the facades that we so often put on with other people, you know, to pretending this, you know, how we create our own image and then we try and, you know, present this image to the world. It, it's like, you know, that's what you do on Facebook, isn't it? Yeah, you, you put a picture of yourself and then you talk about like all the things you're doing so that you can make other people think you're like this kind of person. And and it's just putting on a facade. Yeah. And it's it's not who we are at all. Uh, you know, I really puzzle about this whole Facebook kind of thing. You know, why people want to create images of themselves and make themselves look like they're somebody who they aren't. Yeah. Because if you make yourself look like somebody you aren't, then the kind of people who are going to be tra attracted to you are people who also are putting on a facade who aren't being honest, okay? And I think you know, we all like people who are, who are honest. You know, I think it's a, a quality that, that you know, many, many of us use when we are you know, thinking of becoming friends with somebody. You know, is this somebody I can trust? Are they honest? And so, you know, learning in our own lives to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with other people, okay? That doesn't mean we go around telling everybody everything, you know, whether they want to hear it or not, yeah. But at least with ourselves to really uh, own up to the things we've done and the things we haven't done and then change our lives so that we don't have those kind of regrets. Yeah, so that, uh, you know, each day at the end of the day, we can look back and say, oh, I, you know, this was a good day. Yeah, this was a good day. I did something virtuous today. 
Yeah, I contributed something today. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. It also, also, you know, if there's relationships in your life that have been broken in some way, yeah, maybe try and repair some of those relationships now. No, this is a good time to do it. In the middle of the pandemic, you, you know, we're all susceptible to getting sick. Yeah, we don't know how long other people are going to be alive. We don't know how long we're going to be alive. So if there's broken relationships, then this is a really good time to, uh, to try and renew them, to revitalize them. Yeah, I think that that's quite important. And so I think especially since it's Mother's Day and many, you know, many people take their parents for granted. And sometimes we're not so nice to our parents. Yeah, our parents are so much a part of our lives that we, they're just like, uh, you know, leave me alone. I'm an adult already. I'm 50 years old. Why are you telling me to put on a sweater? You know, <laughs> or, you know, we get mad at them and, and you know, the over petty, petty things. Um, so this is really a time to fix that, you know? And some people I know in, in the U.S., you know, they don't even talk to their family members. Yeah, they just say, oh, this person is toxic. I don't talk to them. I don't want them in my life. Yeah, but living life, you know, that where, way where you feel like, okay, I can't be near those people. Uh, you know, then that very tense, stressful energy is always with you. Yeah. Whereas if you can just go and learn, just, you know, you don't have to be real close with those people, but can you be friendly? Yeah. People maybe in your family that you, you know, you go, you know, instead of like that, can you be friendly at least? And kind and pleasant and just, you know, chit chat with them when you need to. Yeah, there's nothing off our back to offer friendliness to somebody. And, it, you know, it's, it's uh, quite worthwhile because that other person may be suffering a lot because of the broken relationship. And we may be suffering inside ourselves, too, because the relationship with somebody who we were very close to before is broken. Yeah, so it's good. Take the time to approach them again and, and see if you can connect in some way. You know, again, like I said, you don't have to be best friends, but at least so there's a friendly, a friendly feeling. Um, okay. Then some other things that we can do. Uh, in the time of COVID or not, is one thing that, that's important is to accept our humanity and to accept what we can do and what we can't do. Yeah, many people uh, fall into personal distress or even despair. You know, we, we look at what's happening in India right now with COVID and uh, I heard in Singapore, you know, there was a recent outbreak at a hospital and now they're making people quarantine for three weeks. My goodness. Yeah. I mean, this is the first time I've ever heard of a three week quarantine. That's a long time. So, but anyway, okay. Um, in, instead of just falling into despair about this whole situation, um, to realize that we can't control everything in the world, okay? And we sure wish that what's happening in India uh, with, is, you know, that that not happen. It's horrible. 
It's a tragedy what's happening. One of my Dharma friends died a couple of weeks ago, an Indian Dharma friend who, um, you know, died from COVID. And, you know, and how many others, I, I got a message, another Dharma friend is quite ill in Nepal. So, you know, and that's just people we know. No, I mean, and then there's, you know, thousands upon thousands of people in India, millions of people in India. And, um, you know, instead of getting depressed because we can't do anything, yeah, to at least dedicate our merit for them, to do the taking and giving meditation for them, to accept that, that this is samsara and we cannot control everything. Okay, and that's why we want to aspire for liberation, okay? We want to get out of samsara because we want to get out of this situation where we're under the uh, influence and under the control of afflictions and karma. Yeah, so sorry, I have the hiccups. Okay, so, uh, you know, to really see the nature of samsara, to develop um, the aspiration to be free of samsara, you know, this is a perfect opportunity to do it and to accept what we're able to do and what we're not able to do. And so we can't go to India and make COVID go away, but we can dedicate for people we can make donations to charity, you know, so that they can have the PPE, so that they can have oxygen, you know, so people can have food. So we can do something. And, um, and so let's take advantage and do that. Yeah. You might have heard that the, the US government gave uh, everybody who works here uh, some stimulus money, yeah. So finally, you know, the government, we just get checks from the government because uh, they want people to go out and spend money because it's good for the economy if we do. But, you know, most of us who, you know, at least here at the monastery, uh, the government sent us checks too. Uh, and we gave, uh, we made donations to all sorts of charities, yeah. And it was really nice. It really brought quite a, um, a good feeling. You know, we put envelopes out on the table. There was one for um, food, you know, giving food to people who don't have, one for refugees, uh, one for uh, doctors without borders. What else did we have? Um, all, all different sorts of, of charities, you know, we had, we had, and, uh, and then, you know, people who wanted to could give some of their stimulus money to the charities. Yeah, we gave things to uh, Tibetan Nuns Project, to, uh, do you remember any others? Feeding America. Yeah, Feeding America was a big one. But, um, yeah, and so it was very good, you know, we can't, go and remedy everything, but we can do something, you know? And, and I think that's important to us because we feel connected to people and we are connected to people, yeah? There's no place we can go on this whole planet where we don't live and exist in relationship to every other living being on the planet. You think, oh, I'll go, you know, find some cave somewhere. I'll, I'll lock myself in a, at the 15th floor in a flat in Singapore. You know, I'll be all alone. Uh, you know, we always exist in relationship to everybody. So to, to feel that connection and, uh, you know, and to, and to give and, and rejoice in that connection. Um, another thing to work on, 
uh, is self-confidence. Yeah, use this time instead of uh, putting ourselves down and criticizing ourselves all the time to really establish some self-confidence and, uh, and recognize uh, not only what is going well in our lives, but what we appreciate about ourselves. So appreciating things about ourselves doesn't mean we have to get arrogant and proud about it. Okay, because any good talent or ability, any good quality we have came from other people. They taught us, they encouraged us, and so on. So there's nothing to be proud about. But it, it is important, I think, to recognize what our talents and our virtues and our good qualities are. Okay, uh, instead of what some people often do is, is get into this thing of just putting themselves down, disparaging themselves all the time. And that um, is very unrealistic. Yeah. Often the self-talk that we have towards ourselves, totally unrealistic. And, uh, you know, it's important to recognize our talents and our abilities so that we can use them. Okay. Instead of digging ourselves in a ditch by always, you know, oh, I'm so selfish. I'm so stupid. I can't remember this. I can't do things as well as other people can. Everything I do, I make a mistake. Oh, you know, I mean, Nobody else is putting our, us down. We sit there and tell, tell ourselves this kind of rubbish. Yeah. And that doesn't help us and it doesn't help anybody else either. Okay. So, you know, just as we try to be honest about our mistakes and our faults, we should also be honest about our talents and our abilities. Yeah. And, and without exaggerating our importance one way or, or the other, okay? Um, another thing we can, that is conducive for happiness, COVID or not, is uh, to make peace with the changing nature of our life. You know, that life is always changing and to make peace with that. Yeah, you have kids and your kids grow up. And you have visions for how you want your kids to be, and they turn out very different. Yeah. So why don't you rejoice? Why is it, you know, oh, I wanted my son to do this. I wanted my daughter to do this. Oh, they're not doing the careers I wanted. Yeah. Why do you make yourself miserable about that kind of stuff? Yeah. Your kid has their own unique talents. Let them develop it. Let, you know, rejoice at the good they do in the world. Okay. And, and yeah, just recognize that our, uh, our expectations change. The situation we live in changes. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, if somebody had asked you three years ago, or even two years ago, would you live through a, a worldwide pandemic? How many of us would have said yes? I expected my life to live through a worldwide pandemic. Anybody? No. You know, it, the thought never entered our mind. And yet, here we are. We're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, you know? I remember when it happened, I was thinking, but I thought pandemics, you know, that's the bubonic plague that happened in the Middle Ages. Or that was the, what they called the Spanish flu the, during 1918, right after the First World War, worldwide flu, and so many millions of people died. You know, that's like, that happened way back when. That doesn't happen now. We are modern. 
baloney, you know, the, the virus doesn't care modern or not modern, okay? <laughs> yeah, it, the virus just does what it wants to do and we have to adjust. And so let's, you know, adjust in a good way. Um, another thing that, that uh, often people think about in times like this is uh, what kind of legacy do we want to leave? Okay, what do we want to leave uh, behind given all the people who have helped us in our lives? Yeah, what do we want to leave behind? So I'm uh, right now I'm reading a book by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, I don't know if in Singapore, if you've heard of her, she was uh, the second woman to be a Supreme Court justice. And she uh, was there, she worked very, very hard for uh, women's equality in the face of the law. Yeah. So I'm, I'm reading uh, a book called In My Own Words, and it's some of her talks that she's given. Yeah. And I can see through, you know, as she's talking about the work she did to improve the situation of women in the world, especially legally, you know, that, that she has left an incredible legacy for us. Yeah. I, I didn't know how, uh, how, what's the word? Um, how much discrimination women faced in confront of the law. Yeah. Uh, how people could legally discriminate against women. I, I didn't have any idea about that until I read this book and I'm, I haven't finished it, but she's really talking about what her passion is and, and the cases that she's doing. And I'm going, my goodness, you know, there's things that I enjoy in my life that I take for granted that are actually due to her and what she did in her life. Yeah, I never knew her, but many of the things that, that she did, uh, you know, to make things equal, equal opportunity for women, I come along and I reap the benefit of those things. Yeah, and I'm thinking, wow, what an incredible legacy that she left behind. Yeah. That, that people can benefit from. So she happens to be somebody who was quite well known, who had a good education and a lot of talent and she could do these things. Not all of us are like that, but we all leave behind a legacy in our own small world, okay? Because we influence the people around us, yeah? So what, what do we want to leave behind? How do we want to influence people? Especially considering how many people in our life have been kind to us, who have people who have taught us, who have encouraged us, who um, gave us opportunities that we wouldn't have had before, that, you know, People who were our friends when we needed friends. Yeah. And, and you know, what, what are we going to, how, put it this way, how are we going to pay it forward? Yeah. How can, what can we give in our own sphere of influence, small as it may be, that will benefit other people? Or, recognizing, you know, when we practice the Dharma that actually our sphere of influence is very big because when we generate the bodhicitta motivation over and over and over again, yeah, we are making a connection with each and every sentient being and 
uh, making the vow to, to benefit them and to lead them to full awakening by practicing the path ourselves. So actually we have quite a big sphere of influence. Yeah, because we're setting, making those connections right now with people that in future lives, we will be able to lead on the path or people who in future lives will be able to really benefit in an enormous way. Yeah, so we're making those um, connections now. And just to give you an example, one of my teachers, Kyabje Sang Rinpoche, many years ago, he came to uh, Los Angeles. So uh, this was his previous life. Some of you may have met him in this life. He's about 30 mm, something in this life, but his previous life when he was an old man. So he came to Los Angeles and I was cooking for him. And one day, you know, the people in the house, we took him to the beach. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those um, are they sea urchins or sea anemones? Hmm? anemones? Anemones. So, you know, the the little the animal in the in the ocean, it's kind of round like this and it has a hole here. If you stick something there, it, it closes up. That's how it eats. Yeah. So. He uh, took his prayer beads, and as we were going along the beach, he would put them in the, the mouths of the, all the sea anemones, and their mouths would start to close, and then he would pull the mala out. But he was doing this because he was making a connection with them. Yeah, he was making some kind of karma connection so that they can be his disciples in the, in the future. Another one of my teachers, whenever he's uh, on the road and there's a roadkill, like a dog or a cat or a, or a, um, a raccoon or you know some animal has been killed in the road, he makes the driver pull over and then he says mantra over the, the dead animal. Again, he's, he's making karmic connections with different beings to be able to benefit them in future lives. Sometimes I wonder with my teachers, if that's how I wound up fortunate enough to be their disciples, because maybe I was an animal like that in a previous life. And they said some mantra, you know, over me or, you know, patted, I was a dog or a cat and they patted me or pet me or something like this. Yeah. So, you know, when we see things like that, then we can make connection with so many living beings. And they say that when you do that with bodhisattvas, uh, you know, or when bodhisattvas make the connection with us, you know, then we can be their students in the in bodhisattva students in the future. And similarly, when we go out of our way, to make connections like that with other people, yeah, then in a future life, when we have Dharma realizations, we can really benefit those people. Yeah. So when you go to the grocery store, say hi to people. Yeah. When you're, in, uh, when you're on the MRT, say hi to people, smile at people. You know, there's, there's all these ways to, to make connections. When you have to call, make a phone call to somebody you don't know about some kind of administrative something, something, you know, be nice, be pleasant, have a, have a good attitude towards them. Because we this way we establish these karmic relationships and then we, we can make prayers for those people and then really be of great benefit to them in the future. Okay, um, another thing that we may want to do to, to, to create causes for happiness is to stop making up unreal stories, okay? Some people say, uh, be more in the present, yeah. So they come to the same point. 
Yeah, because so often we're living our life in the present, but our mind is making up stories about the past, making up stories about the future, spinning around, worrying about this, dreading that, looking forward to something else, okay? And, and then we create all sorts of emotions in ourselves, worrying about things that haven't happened, that are very unlikely to happen. Okay, so for example, this morning I woke up, okay? And I, uh, I was reading the news a little bit. And so maybe you know this too, that there's a, a rocket that China uh, fired, that they, they launched uh, some, a space station or something into space. And the rocket that launched is out of control. It's rotating around the earth and it's gonna fall into the earth and they don't know where it's gonna fall, okay? And they have no control over the rocket. This was in the news this morning, okay? So I'm sure some people went, the rocket is gonna fall right on top of my house. Yeah, because the, the um, space agencies and the scientists, they're following the rocket and they figure that within maybe an hour of when it's gonna crash into the earth, then they'll know approximately, approximately where it will land. But at the same time, they said, chill out, don't worry. It's very, very uh, uh, minor chance that it will fall on top of you. Okay. But I'm sure, I mean, this is a perfect thing. If you want to be neurotic and worry, I mean, what a great thing to worry about and be afraid of. Yeah, a 22 ton, I think, no, 220 ton. But anyway, it's a huge rocket. It's 100 feet tall. So it's like the, the size of a 10 story building. And it's going to crash into the earth and they don't know where it's going to crash. <laughs> okay. It sounds like a sci-fi movie, doesn't it? If my mother were alive, she would be all panicked, worrying that it was going to crash into her house. Yeah. And of course, the scientist is saying, don't worry, very unlikely. You know, 70% of the Earth's surface is water. It'll probably, you know, land in the Pacific Ocean somewhere. Uh, you know, so chill out but it might land on top of you, <laughs> you know? So we have this amazing tendency as human beings to, to we're like, you know, drama writers or sci-fi writers making up horror stories. Actually, that's what we do. We're like the people, the guy who write, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or Frankenstein, because we, we make up stories about our lives of all these horrible things that are, could happen and this and that. And then we get all worried about them. Okay. Yeah. Anybody here do that? Okay. I see a couple of people who are honest. Yeah. So either we worry about, you know, like, oh, oh, if it's not this rocket that lands on top of me, it'll be, it'll be what? Oh, all the, how do you say it? Chi, chi, grasshoppers, you know, the, chi, the grasshoppers that make a lot of noise. So there's a billions of them that are all set to, to uh, hatch on the eastern part of the U.S., Oh my God, what happens? They come in your house, they fill your house up. They squeak at night. You know how they, they rub their legs together and they say, I'm not going to be able to sleep. Oh no, you know, these incense, insects are going to keep me from sleeping. 
this is terrible. What am I going to do about it? How can we get rid of them? Yeah. And so we worry about all these things. How, you know, it's like, are these really going to happen? Yeah. So, um, you know, there are some things that might happen, but very low chance. But we worry about them. Also in the paper, there was the story about one lady and she, in her house, there were like a hundred thousand bees that made a hive inside her house. Yeah. Oh, that's another thing. Wow. You can worry about that. Yeah. Like I said, when you're a Buddhist, you don't get bored. You can worry about having 100,000 bees in your house. And then the rocket lands on top of you and squashes the bees. But then the cicadas come in and they're squeaking and you can't think straight. Yeah. So, you know, it, we laugh. But look at some of the things we worry about. Yeah, they're equally as laughable. And yet we use our human potential to worry about stupid things. Yeah? So um, instead of using our, our human potential to worry about things or to plan things, that's another thing we do, is we plan. Okay. How many of you like to plan? Yeah, every single detail, you have everything planned out. Okay, today, you know, I woke up at six o'clock. No, I woke up at five o'clock. Oh, no, I overslept. I woke up at 5.01. This is terrible. I'm off to a bad start today. I woke up late. Yeah. And, or then we get all into, oh, today, what am I going to do? Oh, yeah. What, what am I going to do today? Uh, uh, and you have your whole day planned out what you're going to do. Yeah. Like yesterday, I had most of the day free. So I woke up in the morning and I said, I'm really going to work on the, you know, because I'm in the middle of writing one of the books for His Holiness. So I'm really going to work today on the book. Well, I didn't work at all on the book yesterday. Why? Because I had email overload. I got so many emails that all day long I was processing emails. Okay. And, and I wrote two, two letters to inmates. Okay. So when I woke up in the morning, I had a plan. Goodbye. That plan out the window. Yeah. So we have to learn, you know, instead of planning things so intricately and then getting upset when our plans don't happen the way we, we want them to to learn to relax a bit. Yeah. Okay, uh, another thing that's good to do is uh, pay more attention to nature. Now, I know for those of you living in Singapore, it's really difficult because in Singapore, yeah, what is what do you grow the most? Concrete and asphalt. Yeah. So how do you pay attention to nature in Singapore? Yeah. Well, there, you know, there's a few parks in there. Yeah. So you can look at the green grass. You can go to the zoo to the zoological garden. Yeah. You can go to um, the reservoir. Yeah. You can look at some of the flowers. They have pretty flowers, okay. But to to be more in tune with with nature, or you know what you can do to get more to pay more attention to nature and to plan things, you can plan a trip to the Abbey 
for after COVID. Yeah. Then you, wow, you can really get into planning everything. And then you can come here and we'll take you out into the forest. Okay. Some of you have been here. You've been in the forest. We'll put you to work. Yeah. And you'll really get in touch with nature there. Okay. So anyway, I just looked at the clock and I should have stopped a while ago so we could have questions. So I'll stop now and you can ask questions and uh, we'll see if there are answers or not. All right, thank you Venom Rose for your teachings. Thank you so much. And now we have some questions here from our uh -huh. participations from Zoom. All okay. right, so... Um, just now, Venerable have mentioned some taking and giving meditation with Tonglen in Tibetan, right? Mm -hmm. So um, can you share more about it? Yeah. Okay. So this is a, a meditation where we imagine taking on others' suffering and giving them our uh, body, our virtue, and our possessions. Okay. So it's a very powerful uh, meditation what we do, uh, okay, first of all, I'm going to recommend some books because um, I can't give a full explanation here. In the, the best explanation of this is in a book called uh, Transforming Adversity into the Path. Huh? Into Joy and Courage. Uh, no. Cancer Jump Addiction. What, what's the new, they retitled it. Transforming Adversity into Joy and, and Courage. courage. Okay, Transforming Adversity into Joy and Courage. Although I thought they retitled it. Anyway, it's by uh, Geshe Jampa Tepchok. Okay, chapter 11 in that book is about the taking and giving meditation. It's a, the best explanation I've ever seen of that. Um, also in His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's book, uh, in Praise of Great Compassion, there's a section on the taking and giving meditation. Okay, so briefly, what you do in the meditation is you imagine people who are suffering in some way or another. It could be physical, mental, spiritual, you know, whatever kind of suffering. And you, de you develop a sense of compassion for these people wanting to take uh, their suffering, yeah? And so then you imagine their suffering leaving them in the form of smoke or pollution. And as you inhale it, yeah, you, their suffering is leaving them and you're taking it into yourself with the attitude of compassion to free them from suffering. But you don't just take on others' suffering and then sit there and like feel lousy. But you imagine, you know, your own self-centered thought or your own, um, you know, self-grasping ignorance as a lump in the middle of your chest at your heart chakra. And as you take on others' suffering, you imagine it to turn into like a lightning bolt that hits that lump at your heart, the lump at your heart of your own self-centeredness and pain and hurt and grudges and all of that kind of yucky stuff. It it's gets demolished. And in, in place, in, in your heart, there's just this open space, you know, where you are free of your own self-grasping ignorance, you're free of your own self-centered mind. And then within the, this open space, you imagine the light, and then you think of transforming your body into what other, whatever or whoever other people need. You imagine transforming your possessions into what other people need and sending it out to them. And then even your merit from your Dharma practice, yeah, you imagine giving that uh, away to all living beings too. OK. 
okay? And so you, you take on their suffering with compassion, you give your body possessions and merit with love, wanting them to have happiness in its causes. So it's a very powerful meditation to do. Okay, so here's another question. Uh -huh. um, some people who live in solitude, I, mean, I think it's probably is a person who live just only one person. And then mm -hmm. the people is like, ah, I don't want to get help. Just let me die in this cold. And then how to keep them to motivated to living? So again, they're living by themselves. And what, they're sick or they're afraid um, of getting Just sick? like they think very negatively to the COVID. They just think that, just let me die, don't help me. Uh, they think mm. very negatively, I think. In this yeah. question, yeah. Okay. So I get so many questions from people about how to help other people. Yeah. But mm, who's yeah. the person we can help the most? Who's the person we can change? the easiest. Isn't that yourself? So. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't try and change other people. Don't try and help other people. No, in fact, as a Buddhist, we should do our best to do that. But what I am saying is sometimes we get so involved in I want to change this person and I want to change that person. And we can't change them. Yeah, but the person we can change is ourself, but we don't acknowledge our own bad habits and try to change them. So first, before you try and change somebody else who is thinking negatively, ask yourself, am I thinking negatively? Yeah. Am I just sitting there feeling depressed and negative? And if you are, then use the Dharma that you've learned to improve your own mood. Okay. Then how to, how to make somebody else feel better? Just go and be a friend. Yeah. Go and be a friend. That's all. Ask them questions, listen to them talk, steer the conversation towards something pleasant. Just be a friend. If you go in there with the, with the thought, oh, this person thinks so negatively, I'm going to change them. Forget it. Yeah? Then you're not going to listen to that person. You're not going to tune into where they're at because you're too busy thinking of how you can change them. Yeah. Often the best way to help somebody is to listen, you know, to have some empathy or have a sense of humor or talk about something that they're interested in with them. Okay. Instead of having a plan about how you want them to be. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So another question um, here. So um, it's asking about how to fix a broken relationship. So she said, how do we reconcile broken relationship? And we are not sure if others uh, haven't ready yet. Yeah. Okay. So you're not sure if, if others are ready. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you send them a note. Yeah. Or you text them or send them an email or actually write them a card by hand and send it. And you say, you know, I've, I've been thinking about you and... Would you like to talk? Or if you have something that you want to apologize for, you know, write it and say, you know, I've been thinking about something I said to you years ago or something I did. And I really have a lot of regret about that. And I just want you to know that. 
And then, you know, then leave it to the other person to respond to you. And if they want to have contact, then they'll, you know, if you write a sincere message from your heart, uh, you know, then, and they feel that, then they'll write back or, or they'll contact you back. Sometimes it may take them a while, yeah, depending what the relationship was like. But uh, the important thing is that from our side, in our mind, we have reconciled with that person, that we're not holding a grudge, that we're not holding a mind of antipathy towards them. Okay, okay so another question. Mm, all right. So here's, I think it's got a connection with today's Mother Days, right? So yeah. what is the best way to repay the kindness of our parents? Take out the garbage. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Because, okay, people, you know, you know that if, I mean, it would, be lovely, it'd be wonderful if your parents were interested in the Dharma, if they could create some merit, so that then when they passed away, you know, they, from practicing generosity, from, you know, showing kindness to other people, and so on, you know, they would have merit. So the bet, so if you want your parents to learn about the Dharma, either leave books around the house, or take out the garbage because yeah especially on mother's day your mother will go you know like she knows you've been going to buddhist classes and things like why why am i kid going to buddhist classes what's he learning there and you come home and you take out the garbage your mom and your dad are gonna go oh my goodness I've been asking my son or daughter to take out the garbage for 30 years. They go to a Buddhist class and then they come home and take out the garbage. Buddhism is great. I want to learn about it. You know? So do something like that. That, you know? They've been telling, you know, there are things that they've been asking you to know, clean up your room. Yeah, clean it up. Yeah. So, you no, know, it doesn't, uh, you know, do something helpful towards them. And if you can invite them to a Dharma talk, or, you know, like I said, just leave Dharma books around the house, or, you know, if your parents already do some chanting or some meditation, you know, do some of that with them. Um, yeah, then that's really good. You, you're planting good seeds in their minds. Yeah. Okay. And another, th another thing, yeah. tell your parents, thank you. Oh. Yeah. Thank them for uh, feeding you in the middle of the night when you were a baby and you cried. Yeah. Did you ever think of that? How many times your mom got up and fed you in the middle of the night when you were a baby and you cried and you didn't say please and you did, didn't say thank you. You just said, yeah. And then your mom, who's, you know, sleep deprived for years, got up and very happily fed you. Yeah. Did you ever thank your mom for doing that? Yeah. Did you ever thank your mom or your dad for teaching you how to talk or for teaching you manners or for making you do your homework? Okay. There's all sorts of things that our parents did for us that, you know, as kids, we just took for granted. And it's nice to, um, I did that with my parents. Yeah is I, I wrote them cards and I would just thank them, you know, thank them for having me, thank them 
for giving uh, for giving me a, a good education. Yeah. So all those things that that they've done. No, I mean they went out and worked every, you know, every day to earn the money that then they used to buy us uh, food, to buy us toys, to make sure that we had an education. Yeah, so thank them for those kinds of things. Okay, so I think here's okay. another question. So okay. um, during the pandemic, his or her mother-in-law decide to set up a will and um, she or she try her best to encourage them to donate to charity instead of leaving those monies to those children. But the mm -hmm. mother-in-law are not willing to do so. So what can we do? Also, um, another <laughs> thing is for the funeral. So... Um, she is not a Buddhist, so what should we advise her on her best on the best way to send her off peacefully? Mm, okay, so you know it's not our business how somebody else uses their money. Yeah, if we can, you know, encourage them to give it away, but if it's their money, they can do with it what they want. It's not up to, uh, up to us, if I understood the question correctly, to tell somebody else what to do with the money from when they sold their house, okay? Then the second part of the question, um, somebody has died, and so how to send that person out, off, or it's a relative who's not Buddhist. Uh, I didn't understand who was the dead person and who was the non-Buddhist. Do you want to? Uh, did you? Um, yeah. I think here it said that the the one who that is death is not the Buddhist. So how uh, can we help them to rest in peacefully? Okay, so they've already died, or they're in the process of dying. Uh, but yeah. In the question, they didn't mention very clear. Yeah. Okay. Didn't okay. Mention. If. If, if they're still alive and they're in the process of dying, then uh, ask them to, to think of the good things that they did in their life, to rejoice in their compassion, to rejoice in their love, to rejoice in their generosity, yeah, to rejoice in whatever they contributed to the world. So as somebody's dying, if, if they can rejoice at what they did, especially, uh, you know, the compassion and help that they gave other people, uh, then that's really good, you know. Um, if they belong to another religion, then you can ask them to think of whoever it is that they worship in that religion. That's fine. You know, something that, that fills their mind with faith is, is very good. Um, you know, after they die, uh, you know, if, if, you know, if, if you're just around them, you're not the person in charge of organizing the funeral or anything, um, then you can still say some mantra. You can make Buddhist style prayers. You could read Buddhist scriptures. You want to be sensitive about the other relatives there if they belong to another religion. But if you're alone with the, the person's body, you can just uh, recite Buddhist things, you know, that's fine. So I think we're gonna have to stop now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. And thanks for answering all those questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hope that everyone has been benefited and I'm so sorry that if your question is not be asked because the time due to the time constraint, right? Yeah. All right. So then I believe some of us might have heard about the building of Buddha Hall project. And in the last talk, we have already mentioned that, but I will do another introduction for those who didn't attend last time. The Buddha Hall is the long awaited temple space, the crown jewel of buildings at Sarvasti Abbey. No monastery is complete without its Buddha's hall. 
And well, our beautiful log cabin meditation hall has served its purpose well for 17 years. It was always a temporary solution. Now with a resident community of 17 monastics and pre-COVID attendance at AB programs, regularly surprising 50 people, the meditation hall is just too small to contain all the Abbey's downward activities. When the Abbey opens up again, we expect an even greater surge of people seeking methods to cultivate peace. The Buddha Hall will be a two-story and then 17,000 square foot temple and library, a spiritual home for all beings. It will be a center of spiritual practice and Dharma educations for monks, nuns, and lay visitors too. The Buddha Hall welcomes all the Sangha from the 10 directions and it will build to last for thousands of years. A tribe of Kai donors invite Abbey friends to match their 250,000 channels gift by July 14 to jumpstart this project as it can begin in this summer. May we invite everyone to join us in this act of supporting the building of Buddha Hall. So actually there's one last question here. So how can we help <laughs> to do the Buddha Hall? <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, how can you help build the Buddha? Uh, well, you know, uh, there, there's two basic ways. One way is um, recite the Buddha's mantra, meditate on the Buddha, and recite the mantra and send us uh, the counts of how many mantra that you've said, because we think that uh, chanting, you know, the mantra will help create the merit. Thinking about the Buddha and his qualities will help create the merit so that we're able to build the Buddha hall. And then also um, making donations, very helpful, um, you know, because it's a huge project. So donations are, are, are helpful. Um, you know, if you want to come build, uh, we can have you in touch with our contractor and you can help. Uh, but we invite you all after it's built to come and, uh, you know, meditate and hear Dharma teachings and so on uh, in the meditation hall in the building. Okay, so thank you for the answer. And then here, um, a kind volunteer from the Abbey has spent a lot of time and effort to do a video for this project. So mm -hmm. maybe we can watch this video together now. Thank you. Do you show the video? Oh, he does. Okay. We saw how the Abbey uh, transformed from nothing to the current state. And we find that uh, we just don't have enough space. The building of the Buddha Hall will be a success so that more people, more students in the West are able to benefit from it. I wish this Buddha Hall can accommodate and attract more people, give opportunity to more people to taste the beauty of the Buddha Dharma, and also may the Buddha Hall be the landmark of the Buddha Dharma spread in the North America. It's getting crowded in the hall. We can get 50, 65, 70, you know, we get a lot of people. And I think that attendance retreat will keep on growing. As much that we want to grow the compassion up from a larger pond of the lotus, therefore that we need to have a space, a larger space to accommodate more people so they can inspire the mind, can cultivate the mind and inspire more wisdom. And therefore that is a need for a Buddha Hall. Buddha Hall is the largest building that we will ever build. Its function will be the centerpiece of the community in terms of the religious life. All the practices, teachings, most everything will happen there. I think this is going to be the most beautiful building that we've ever built. Building the Buddha Hall will take all of our efforts. It will take the generation of an enormous amount of merit and it will also take funding. The Abbey needs $500,000 to jumpstart the Buddha Hall project to begin this summer. A trio of challenged donors has contributed $250,000, but now it's our turn. 
These generous donors have invited Friends of the Abbey to match that total by July 14th. If we match that total, Buddha Hall construction will begin. I hope all of you will come here and practice together with us um, so you can also receive some direct benefit from building the Buddha Hall. Great things are not accomplished by one person alone, but when people join together in a virtuous cause, the results can be amazing. Can you help double that gift to ensure that the Abbey can build a temple large enough for all of us to share the teachings on love, compassion, and wisdom? Will you help the Abbey in their mission to create peace in a chaotic world? It will take all of us, but together we can and will build the Buddha Hall. Together we build the Buddha Hall. Together we we'll build the Buddha Hall. <laughs> Together we build the Buddha Hall. Together we build the Buddha Hall. Together we build the Buddha Hall. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, I saw that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi All right, so everyone. Here, offer, okay. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Hi, one, two, three. Thank you, see you, see you. Good. Okay. Let's just do a short chant to to dedicate the merit. Oh, sure. we go. Thank you for the beautiful flowers. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And thank you, thank so you to, to YBAM for organizing everything and also to FOSA Singapore. Thank you. And um, yes, BGF. hope. Huh? BGF. And BGF, yes, too. So all the organizers and thank you all for coming. Very good. Take care. Bye-bye.